we move next to Glasgow on our Atlantic journey, and uh, our next speaker is Professor Dominic Miller. Dominic is a professor of veterinary epidemiology and veterinary public health at the School of Veterinary Medicine in, in Glasgow. He is a diplomat of the European College of Veterinary Public Health and a Royal College of Veterinary Surgeon recognised specialist in veterinary public health. He is the director of EPIC, that's the Scottish Government Centre for Expertise in Animal Disease Outbreaks, and he is a consultant in veterinary public health for Public Health Scotland under a formal service level agreement. Um, the majority of their work revolves around contributing to and facilitating a One Health approach to zoonotic diseases and antimicrobial resistance and the wider UK. Um, Dominic represents the public he health in, in Scotland on the Human Animal Infections Risk Surveillance Group and the DEFRA Antimicrobial Risk Resistance Coordination Group. He, Dominic chairs the Five Nations Veterinary Risk Assessment Group, which is a group of veterinary risk assessment experts from the British Isles who regularly meet to discuss various animal health risks facing the various nations. Um, we in the Department of Agriculture are, de are delighted to be involved with that group and we find it highly useful and we're very thankful for Dominic for all the work he does in leading it. Dominic's talk this evening is, is entitled Making a, um, a Dog's Breakfast of a Pig's Ear which, as you will see, has both a literal and a metaphorical title. So over to you, Dominic. Thanks very much, Damien, and, and thanks very much to um, for having me along to this event this evening. I'm enjoying it a great deal, and I wish you great success for the week. And as Damien says, my title is, is uh, has a sort of metaphorical ring to it which i hope translates um, and into sort of making a bit of a mess of things and and that's a sort of comment that i'll i'll come back to in relation to one health um, and probably reprise on one or two of the things that the previous speakers said but there's also a literal part to this story as well in that we use pig's ears um, for dog food and i think that's a great thing um, that we're we're making use of byproducts of human food production and finding a way to use those without rather than throwing them away and in, in doing so we perhaps make a bit of money in the, in the process so that's all very laudable and and good sense um, but unfortunately there there is a the, the potential to inadvertently create a, a new pathway of uh, pathogens from animals to people and the papers on the right hand side of this the scientific papers that are quoted there are just some examples of salmonella outbreaks that have occurred um, associated with these products particularly when we um, cut corners on the, the the processing of these things and um, or they come from places from which you know where, where our guard might be down and included in this are some salmonellas that carry antimicrobial resistance too so there's a sort of double whammy in doing this kind of thing, albeit from very good motives and probably ones that should continue um, in, in a world challenged by a growing population and all the climate change impacts and so on. So in scope, in what I want to talk about uh, are pretty much anything to do with human, human and animal interaction. And I put health in brackets because <clears throat> lots of things I'm thinking about don't involve disease or infectious disease that the other speakers have so far focused on but also the the health benefits that people derive from using animals for recreation and occupation and just generally enjoying their company and and the the pictures included here potentially limitless but hopefully cover a range of um, interactions with animals that people recognize and the, i suppose the fundamental thing to say is these are very much part of life and long may they continue to be and so you know there is in, in people's mind, and for good reasons, um, and none better than those put forward by the first two speakers, reasons to be wary of interacting with animals because of the risks. But we mustn't forget that, by and large, we derive a great deal of benefit, and we don't want to stop that. And as the other speakers have said, this is sort of described as One Health, and there's a great paper from The Lancet here, which is not a journal I read very often, um, on just this um, and in the sort of top bit of text on the left hand side it goes on to say that understanding these zoonotic diseases is a bit of a it's a bit of a big job you've got to 
know about animal medicine and human medicine, you've got to know about ecology, sociology, microbial ecology and evolution, and the underlying issues that drive increased transmission. And that's just talking about the bad side of it. Um, so it's a big ask to be good at One Health, a really big ask. Um, and the article also emphasizes what both of the first speakers have said, that essentially all of this is our fault. It's our encroachment on wildlife habitat appropriating land, stealing from the natural world, if you like, um, and, and human behavior is what drives all this. Again, the other speakers have put up similar sort of diagrams to the one I'm showing here, which try to explain what One Health is about. And I don't want to dwell on it too much. There are many, many of these. But I think the important thing about them to take away is, first of all, they're very complex. And that's sort of re-emphasizing the point I said before but also that they're, they're, they're really about mechanisms of, of how biology interacts in these different, if you like, areas of the ecosystem. Um, so they're, they're sort of mechanistic and, and, and biological, but they ignore, in my view, um, or at least they don't explicitly include the notion of what human behavior might do. And, and so there's quite a growing literature on what what kind of things people choose to do that aren't necessarily straightforward, easy to understand biological interactions, but they actually complicate the picture considerably. And again, there are a selection of scientific articles here that touch on different parts of this. But the one at the bottom on the right hand side um, comes from Canada and, and talks about um, the impact of people who have dogs and walk them in terms of reduced cardiovascular disease and begins to put that into Canadian dollars in terms of how much that saves the healthcare budget. And so, you know, there's all kinds of different forces at work here. And to emphasize that a bit more, I, I focus on this book, which I show on the right-hand side here, Poverty Safari. It's the kind of book that I would never read. It's the sort of book that it's just sort of sort of thing that I'm not interested in but I came upon it in a bookshop one day and it, 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 I saw it and it happened to be about Glasgow which is where I live and I'm interested in it and I, I thought well, I'll, I'll buy it and who knows if I'll read it and I picked it up and I found it absolutely compelling completely compelling and I couldn't put it down underlined loads of it and um, I go back to it time and again and the reason is because it makes me think about things that I wouldn't normally think about because I'm so preoccupied about the biological interaction and it talks a lot about the stress that society is under in all kinds of ways and what impact that has on the complexity that was already complex in the first place. So I think it's, to me, that's a really important part of what One Health is about. So if we, if we check in on One Health, and, and there's a lot of things I'm going to, that I'm going to say here that sort of agree with Professor McNamara's comments to begin with. And, I'm using again a book uh, which is shown on the right um, and a particular chapter from that book which is about one medicine and, and as recently as 2016 that was describing One Health as an interdisciplinary bandwagon that was sort of jumped on by lots of people who wanted to try and get more money into what they are doing because they're doing something that's re relevant to human health and, and it was described as a, a veterinary land grab um, and that really for boosting the status of vets uh, and uh, as we've seen already it, our, our kind of slice of the cake is pretty small and sparse compared to that of human medicine. It says most discussions of One Health have been published in the veterinary literature and that is certainly true and that engagement by the medical profession has been seen to be lacking and I, I was lucky enough to go to the first well, self-appointed World One Health Congress, which was held in Melbourne in 2011. And one of my fellow delegates there said, well, here we are again, another half health conference. And that was really because uh, in a sort of a, a group of 200 odd people, well, more than that, sorry, three, 400 odd people, there were a handful of doctors, if that. But I think we've come quite a long way since then. And, and some of it even predates that. So I, I, I found, this story in a, in a Saturday newspaper magazine 
Um, and the book associated with it is on the right. And, and, and it's really talking about end of life choices and all that kind of thing. But it tells the story of a doctor in North America who found himself in charge of a number of care homes. Um, and on going to see those, he, he discovered that the patients there were, were, were suffered the attack, as described below, of these three plagues of boredom, loneliness, and helplessness. And that the setting was very clinical. It was highly regulated, very hygienic, and so on. And his sort of crusade that's described in the book and, and the, the article was to try and bring some life back to those people by literally putting life into those nursing homes. And he jumped through all kinds of hoops, administrative and legislative, to be allowed to introduce not only animal life, but plant life there too, and describes very, very positive effects on the, the patients who, who, who warm to that particular stimulus. So again, it sort of re-emphasizes that from an animal point of view, human animal, intera human animal interaction ain't all bad. And I think we, we know lots about the risks and we're quite good at managing microbiological risks. Whereas we're not so good at understanding the, the sort of mental health stuff. And it's quite difficult to put those two things into an equation and, wait and trade them off against each other. Coming a bit closer to home and the sort of work that I've been involved in, um, we have worked for a while on antimicrobial resistance. And I've been lucky to be part of a human health funded initiative on that. And one of the things we did with human health uh, resources really was to build um, a, a website for farmers and animal keepers in Scotland and really to focus on disease avoidance as, as perhaps at least in terms of our own farmers a, a more acceptable uh, term than, than biosecurity um, for, for trying to reduce the, the level of endemic disease and therefore the requirement to use antibiotics to treat that disease and so this is developing animal health resources, sorry, de yeah, well, developing animal health resources using human health resources, hopefully for joint benefit. And so the translation here is sort of between disease avoidance, biosecurity in a hospital that, we, that would be termed infection prevention and control, but essentially it's the same thing. And we're very pleased that our cabinet secretary for the rural economy and our president of the National Farmers Union allowed us to launch that at the AgriScot event in 2017. So coming to the sort of end of what I was going to say, in summary, I then have some concerns in, in that I think that, as the other speakers have said, fully understanding what's going on in the ecosystem is just as elusive as ever. We don't really know what's going on there, which means if we stay in that state, then the, the policy we develop and the interventions we make um, with the best intentions, perhaps, are based on assumption. And we probably take insufficient account of the, uh, the human factors in terms of what people are prepared to do, put up with, and what corners they will try to cut. And so we always end up with these unforeseen and under, unintended consequences, which we then have to go and fix. Uh, and, and, you know, with the benefit of retrospect, we think we wish we'd never done some of those things. So that arises, I think, partly because um, there's a lack of coordination, particularly of research in relation to a, a live gap analysis. So researchers are pretty happy to do, you know, to work as long as they're getting funded and they're, they're not worried about making several pieces of the same jigsaw. And I, I say that against myself as a researcher, you know, I work in an academic institution and I'm level that against myself and, but I think that that is a is a terrible waste of effort and resource if we leave some pieces of the jigsaw empty and we have to guess what's in there and of course there's a there's a, there's a reputational damage which which maybe is less important but but at least um isn't going to convince people that we're, we're we're the good guys on the side of trying to make things better so I would propose then that we, we try to think of One Health as an institution for interpretation and coordination. And that if you look at the different jigsaw here now, all the pieces are there. And I'm not advocating that everybody becomes a One Health person. That it, it, as knowledge increases, um, the depth of knowledge 
in, in the individual pieces is really important. We need specialists in those places, for sure. That's really important. And none of them need explicitly B1 Health. They just need to have some peripheral vision and peripheral awareness that the other pieces are there. And then One Health then is, is about seeing and integrating and working with the whole of the big picture, which is naturally generalist and therefore pretty unconventional to resource in a world that's obsessed with specialism. Uh, you know, when did you last see a, jab, a job advert for a jack of all trades? That just don't happen. I would go further and say that, 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 that lot, there's a lot of, in a modern world with, with lots of information technology to focus on data, but by themselves, they're nothing. You need the, you need the experts and the people with the experience to work with those data and turn them into knowledge and knowledge itself is nothing if people don't adopt it and become wise with it so wisdom is really the, the commodity we're after and like the other researchers i don't have a magic wand or, or a knowledge of where where the resources for this are coming from but i i think they're needed so with that i will kind of sum up and i i love this graphic of one health which i've nicked from um the one health sweden institute sorry, initiative and you can find the link to it there and you know the, the big question I think we're all asking is who's the umbrella? Um, and the umbrella covers all those things, and the things underneath mustn't just go on in parallel. They have to integrate. It's not enough for them to be under one umbrella and say we're all doing one health. They have to get closer together. So who's the umbrella is important. Probably as important is who's hiring the umbrella. So with that, I'll acknowledge um, lots of groups that I've been lucky enough to work with and learn from and um, leave you with the pig's ear and the dog ball. Thank you very much for listening. Um, thank you very much, Dominic. Um, I think you gave us plenty of food for choice there, or, or food for thought, never mind food for choice. Um, I think I think you made a very interesting point there about the, um, the benefits we derive from, from animals. I think we focus a lot on the economic benefits, but there are, but there are lots of social benefits um, through companionship, and I suppose for farmers providing their stock, and they they they're probably especially important in a time like this um, when people's social interactions are are have have been curtailed. I think it's um, I think it's clear as well. Um, One health has been a bit lopsided, and I think the integrated approach that you suggest is is very welcome.